and I'm the charter member and executive director of Tai Cal. Today's topic is smart energy investment today and for the future. It's my great pleasure to introduce our moderator, Thomas B. Henry. He's the chief operating officer and co-founder of Uniki Ventures, a Houston-based hybrid energy accelerator. He is leading efforts in building technology bridges with Canada, France, Norway, and Israel. Prior to this, he has worked with Royal Dutch Shell for 28 years. During his 28 year, year career with Shell, Mr. Henry has held a variety of management and technical positions with responsibilities on three continents including roles in the United States, Malaysia, and Netherlands. He has an MBA from, from uh, Stanford University, uh, strategic decision and risk management from Stanford. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henry, Mr. Henry. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon and welcome to, from Houston, Texas. Good evening to our colleagues joining from the Far East. This is the 2020 Thai Global Summit hosted by the Thai Houston chapter. The panel session is on smart energy investment today and for the future. Before we start, we'd like to acknowledge the generous support of our corporate sponsors, BBVA, Saudi Aramco Energy Ventures, HCCS, Apex, Elan Investments, Nexus, Songkran Thai Kitchen, Houston Angel Network, and Munshi CPA. Of course, let's not forget our Thai Charter members, many of whom are on this call. Your membership support is what makes Thai Houston activities in this community possible. A special thanks to Ram Shanoi and Samir Hassan who planned this session uh, tirelessly. So we have an exciting hour panel planned for with our two eminent panelists, Imran Kizilbash of CSL Ventures and Hossam Al Badawi of SCF Ventures, both of whom we'll introduce shortly. Again, I'm Thomas Henry and I'll be your moderator. We expect to have about 30 to 40 minutes of structured discussion, but quite happy to deviate depending upon the questions we receive from you, the audience. So would like to encourage the audience, please place your questions and we'll address that in, in due time. So let's start. Our panelists have been having, having distinguished careers in the oil and gas sector and are leading funds which are investing broadly in the energy sector. I'm going to start a kickoff by asking Imran to actually tell, him, tell a bit about yourself and then a bit more on CSL Capital Ventures. Appreciate the, the introduction, Thomas. So my name is Imran Kizilbash. Um, um, I'm first of all honored to be on this panel, so thank you for, for having me on it. Um, my background is I'm a mechanical engineer by training. I went to school on the West Coast of the United States to Caltech, got my bachelor's and master's from there, joined an energy services company by the name of Schlumberger, uh, spent about 29 years with them, 20 years in operations, both domestically in the U.S. and internationally, Europe, Middle East, uh, Far East, um, so pretty much a global um, career. And then Towards the latter part of my career, I spent about, I went to the dark side, as I call it, to finance and spent about nine years on the, in, in, a, in a financial capacity. I left Schlumberger nearly three years ago, uh, joined CSL Capital Management um, in the summer of 2018, been there about two and a half years currently in MD at the firm. Um, uh, Thomas, you had asked a little bit of background on, on CSL Ventures. Before going into ventures, I think it'd be worthwhile just to set context of where CSL fits in. So CSL is a private equity venture capital firm uh, started by Charlie Lycombe back in 2008. So we've been around for 12, 13 years. We've deployed about $1.7 billion of capital, uh, really focused on the energy sector and energy broadly speaking, but much more on the services and equipment manufacturing side, rather than going into traditional uh, greenfield uh, investments. Um, CSL Ventures effort, we basically launched in August of 2018 because we felt strongly that technology is going to play an increasingly more important role on both the industrial and energy sectors. So we launched CSL Ventures in August of 18. We are building a portfolio of about 10 investments. So far, we've made six investments already. Um, so that's a bit about the firm. 
Great, thanks Imran. Uh, Hossam, uh, I'll leave you to introduce yourself and SCF Ventures. Uh, thank you, Thomas, and, and again, thanks to Ty. Uh, been uh, you know honored to be on this panel with Imran and uh, Thomas and uh, speak to you all. Um, uh, my name is Hossam El Badawi, and I've been in the industry for 28 years. Uh, like Imran, I started with uh, Schlumberger. I'm also a mechanical engineer, started with uh, Schlumberger and uh, spent half of my career in, uh, in uh, operations, managing operations globally, and then the second half in product development. And then uh, 11 years ago, I made the switch to the dark side, as Imran says, uh, to finance. And I've been uh, the last 11 years on, on the investment side, uh, mainly investing in energy technology, uh, energy technologies. And I'm, uh, I manage the SCF Ventures, which is a, the ventures arm within SCF Partners. SCF Partners is the first uh, uh, private equity focused on uh, energy services uh, and uh, been around for 30 years. And uh, uh, I would say maybe three plus years ago, we decided to start the effort of uh, the ventures, uh, recognizing the same trends Imran talked about, which is, uh, you know, a low, low oil price commodity will drive uh, uh, operators and, and the industry to, to change the way they work and, you know, reduce their cost and increase their efficiency. And normally this uh, 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 results in, in innovation and uh, you know, one path to take innovation to the market uh, is to support it through a ventures uh, investment. So we decided to participate in that trend. Um, we normally look at uh, companies that are, you know, uh, maybe a little bit of uh, revenue and traction, so we can help them scale up. But also, we've done deals pre-revenue, and we have seven investments in the fund, and we have a small incubator where we also do seed investments, and we have about 10, 10 companies in the in the incubator. Uh, so that's me. Okay, great, excellent. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Hossam and Imran, for that uh, brief uh, outlook of both yourselves, bio, as well as the entity that you guys work in. So let's set the scene now. I mean, uh, we are going to be talking about smart energy investments today and for the future. So in setting the scene, I mean, we'll talk about a bit on the state of the oil and gas, the wider energy market here. I mean, there have been many pundits uh, since the COVID um, uh, issue that has been happened until now. There have been a lot of predictions on where the oil and gas and the energy market is going to go. But um, if you can just think about, you know, three areas when you answer the question from an investor perspective, uh, at a mac macro level, you know, the COVID-19, the demand shock, and linking it to kind of the global oil and gas markets, and then see how you can juxtapose that against the U.S. domestic oil and gas production. And of course, you know, with the recent uh, uh, elections uh, in the U.S., uh, there has been both government and societal pressures on to respond to climate change and the impact of that on the energy supply demand. So based on those three areas, my first question that I have is, you know, from the perspective of the energy sector and you play, how are you seeing the impact of the COVID outbreak nearly 10 months on? So I'm just looking at from a short term perspective, the impact on the business and how are you and your organization responding? So maybe I'll, I'll have Hossam lead that question. Uh, uh, and then we'll have Imran uh, weigh in on that. Sure. So I, I would say, you know, when uh, when the COVID uh, uh, pandemic hit, uh, a lot of people had a huge predictions on how much disruption we're going to have uh, from an oil consumption point of view, oil demand. And uh, I think they were off by a factor of maybe between 3 and 10%. So we ended up, you know, uh, people were talking about uh, sometimes 30 million uh, depending on the market, 30 million of demand, uh, you know, going away. Uh, when the dust settled and we looked at it, we probably had seven or eight million of uh, <clears throat> demand gone away. So I would say this is uh, uh, the first prediction that people initially looked at and, and talked about and they got wrong. The other prediction uh, that people are making is going to be slow uh, recovery of the demand. And, uh, you know, even though now the vaccine in some areas has been you know, rolling out, people are expecting demand to come back maybe over a couple of years rather than, uh, you know, right away after people have the freedom to, you know, uh, travel and, and, and go about their business and life the same way they did before the pandemic. So, you know, you, you can take a position on that and, you know, time will tell, uh, but 
you know, uh, I would err on the side that people are willing to go back and and work and uh, things will change in their in, in their habits. But uh, uh, materially, the, the the demand growth is a story that is growing with population, growing with economic development. So I think we see a rebound on, of demand uh, within the next couple of years. So uh, on U.S. production actually has been uh, a, a, a big reduction in the U.S. production by about two to three million barrels. Uh, and that's not uh, necessarily a bad thing. I think the industry was oversupplied before COVID and, uh, you know, uh, economics have been marginal in many places. And uh, what COVID is, has done in hindsight, obviously it's painful when you have a long position uh, in companies when, when the COVID hits. But uh, overall, long term is actually quite positive in my view, because it accelerated consolidation in the industry, both on the EMP side and on the service side, and uh, you know, to, drove people to take costs out, resize their organizations, and I think we end up with a robust uh, uh, you know industry on the other side of it, as well as uh, you know, it also uh, reduced further the investment in, in exploration, which has been down since 2015. Uh, so at some point, that lack of investment in uh, replacement uh, reserves is going to catch up with us. So I think, you know, uh, if if we can survive uh, that as an industry, I think we end up with a thriving industry on the other side of it at some point. And 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 where do you see kind of the on the climate change and and the so-called societal pressures? Uh, with respect to you know how that energy demand mix is going to be like in in the short term, yeah. for example. So, so absolutely, this is here to stay, and uh, and and I think it's a wake up call. I always, uh, you know, put this analogy in the context of Piper uh, Alpha, you know, in the North Sea when it happened, it completely changed the industry perspective on safety, yes, and uh, forever, yes, and which is a good thing. And I believe this is going to be the same impact where we're going to change our perspective on climate and, uh, and footprint, uh, you know, carbon footprint and all of that. But it's not going to, you know, completely uh, replace uh, oil and gas. I mean, if you look at fundamental economics uh, and how much energy is in the fabric of society today, uh, you know, you just look at California when they had blackouts, they couldn't even do surgeries. Yes. So. The, the, the energy and oil and gas is, is part of the fabric of where we are. What we need to do is we need to be responsible and find ways to uh, lower our carbon footprint. And there's a lot of uh, ways to do that between sequestration, you know, choices between the different type of fuels, you know, economics, uh, you know, incentive uh, to, to do that. But I don't think long term we see oil and gas completely going away. I think the mix shifts with a, a bit of more renewable into it, uh, but of a lot of focus on reducing the carbon. And the US has done that. US has taken uh, you know, a lot of steps to reduce their carbon footprint by just shifting from coal to natural gas, for example, yes. Great. Thanks, Hossam. Um, very enlightening. Uh, Imran, um, your views on, on, on that uh, in terms of the, the, the so-called short-term view of the oil and gas industry and then touch a bit on the climate change and, and where we are looking at, at how you're going to progress. Absolutely, Thomas. So look, um, from a short-term perspective, um, we in the energy sector, broadly speaking, we had a double whammy or doubles black swan event. We had COVID-19 coming in the first quarter of this year, both to Europe and North America, obviously started in China towards the back end of last year. Um, and then you had the Russia, um, Saudi Arabia, if you want OPEC dispute that resulted in essentially opening the taps, excess production being from OPEC being put on stream primarily by Saudi Arabia, but also by UAE and a few other, other countries. So. Uh, the demand destruction that happened um, because of COVID probably reached a peak of about 22 or 23 million barrels a day. And just to put things in context, global um, production or demand and supply is about 100 million barrels a day. And again, if you want to look at global energy from any source, it's about 300 million barrels of oil equivalent. So when you have that 22, 23 million barrels going offline in a very short period of time, when we had the lockdowns across the world, it's probably been the single biggest shock 
that at least the oil and gas sector has seen, which represents probably two thirds of the global energy market. Um, and that's resulted in significant malaise in the industry. Uh, at one point, obviously for one day, because of the, the way the futures markets work, the spot price of WTI was negative, uh, negative 37 if my memory serves me right, or something on that order. Um, so it's it's been pretty, uh, if you want a roller coaster ride. Um, I agree with Hossam that that the industry um, has a has a long term future, and when I say long term future, meaning oil and gas has a role to play in the energy transition, um, and then associated with that is the fact that demand is is coming back. Um, if you looked at road transport or road demand, both in China and even in India, it's coming back to pre-COVID-19 levels. The sector that is significantly down on the demand destruction is the aviation sector. So kerosene or jet kerosene is, is the one place where demand destruction is still there. Um, and we're currently probably running at about 92, 93 million barrels of crude oil demand as we speak, um, which will slowly recover, uh, in my view, going into 2021 and eventually reaching an even keel versus 2019, probably at some point in 2022. Um, so that's, if you want a little bit on the oil and gas side. Um, to your other question on, or other two points I think you'd asked was on US production. I, I think we have to recognize what the industry has done for the United States in terms of production increase, just to put things, some numbers there. Total um, oil production, I am talk, talking purely crude oil, was 5 million barrels at the end of 2008. And we reached a peak of 13 million barrels a day, uh, allowing the US probably for the first time reach energy self-sufficiency overall from a macro perspective. So that's been a pretty phenomenal feat to go from five to 13 million barrels. That's the equivalent production of nearly a Saudi Arabia, not quite, but nearly. Um, and so that's pretty phenomenal. Um, the second aspect you'd asked was on energy transition. Look, energy transition is here to stay. Um, the only challenge I think is that energy, for energy transitions to take place, it takes decades. And uh, I went and looked at a very interesting paper uh, that JP Morgan put out um, um, earlier this year. And if you looked at the energy transition from wood to coal, if you looked at oil, the transition to oil, the transition to natural gas. Each one of those transitions with the new fuel took roughly 40 years to take 20% market share. So now we're doing, if you want solar and wind as the two primary renewable fuels. And if you say that journey started in 2010, I, I, we would all love to make it switch in a space of one year or two years or five years. Energy transitions take time. That's a key point I just wanted to highlight. And if you went back in history and looked at all of them, they've taken multiple decades for that transition to take place. So one of the things that I just want to follow on on that, do you feel that there'll be more barriers towards oil and gas development and more enablers for energy type, uh, a renewable energy type uh, uh, transition? So we've, we've already seen that in, in terms of cost of capital. So if you, if you look at, the cost of capital access to renewable projects, solar and wind versus fossil fuels, and here I'm talking oil and natural gas, that cost of capital because of such, uh, if you want societal changes and government regulation, we're already seeing an impact on that. And it's driven for two reasons. One is if you were an energy investor from 2015 or 2014 to 2020, you have some pretty bad scars on your back because the industry unfortunately has not delivered on financial returns and investors obviously are now gun shy. And just to put some numbers today, as part of the S&P energy represents probably two to 3% of the total S&P uh, weighting of the, of, the, of the index. That number traditionally used to be 10 at its peak used to get to the early teens. So it's just showing if you want the lack of appetite of investor sentiment because of the lack of performance of the energy sector on financial returns. The second thing is, is obviously from a whole um, climate change perspective, 
if you want, or discussion around that. So today, the cost of capital, if you look for a wind and solar project, is on the order of 3 to 5%. For natural gas, it's around 10 to 15%. For oil projects, it's approaching 20%. So we're already seeing an impact on that in the, in the financial capital markets overall when you look, look at energy, broadly speaking. And I'm going to also make it, if you want a stab at the energy, if you want the oil and gas sector, as we've, we've unfortunately lost the narrative on climate change and if you want the environmental aspect of ESG. And what, what, I, what I mean by that is we haven't, gone front and center as we should have probably 10 years ago or 20 years ago or 30 years ago on the environmental aspect of ESG. And we, we have a significant role to play to look at minimizing, if you want, methane emissions or gas flaring or unnecessary gas flaring or reducing our respective CO2 footprint. So we have, we have a role to play there and we need to take that front and center as an industry. Thank you, gentlemen. I can, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Something here, Thomas. I, th I think I agree with all what Imran said, and I think uh, we, we, as an industry, we need to do a lot more. And as uh, citizens of the world, all of us, we need to be concerned about the global warming, and we need to do something about it. But also, we need to be very practical on the alternatives. So we need to study the alternatives. There is a little bit of a, you know, people selling uh, wind and solar as. 100% clean, but they also have impact on the environment. We need to study that and we need to understand it. So we need to solve the, the overall problem, but we need to solve it with the right tool for the right, uh, you know, problem. Yes. I think, Hossam, you, you, you brought up a very uh, interesting point. I think uh, reducing carbon footprint talks about carbon intensity. And when you talk yeah. about new technologies or renewable technologies, there is a carbon intensity associated with developing those technologies. But that is for a separate topic in a separate uh, session um, in, in light of time and, and yeah. moving forward, uh, we want to talk about the investment themes, correct? And, and the technology areas. I think what is critical is understanding, you know, what, what, what will we be focusing our technologies on? You know, ones, uh, you know, that has got the greatest impact for the oil and gas and the energy transition. So, uh, we understood that in the COVID era, digital technologies made a big play, correct? I mean, remote uh, sensing, remote uh, access of, of, of your fields was a big play. I mean, it, it brought that into, in, into light. Uh, take a look at what we are doing right now via Zoom, correct? So everything has got that digital footprint. So what do you think are some of the current view on the technologies that are going to go forward and going to be impacting the oil and gas and the broader energy transition. Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, Hossam to, to, to lead this off. Yeah, so so I, I would say I think the, the digital is definitely one and it has been recognized as an area for, you know, uh, cost and efficiency savings in, in the industry even before COVID, yes. And if anything, COVID, uh, you know, put a sense of urgency on it. And, and a sense of purpose also on why, why would you do it even uh, because of the, the COVID situation. So I think that's a trend that is accelerating and, and will accelerate. Uh, I always uh, say that, uh, you know, not necessarily when there's a value creation, there's value capture, yes? So the question is who benefits and is there an investment opportunity in that digital or not? Time will tell and in what industry, yes? Uh, so we certainly participate in that. We have investments in that area and we continue to look at that space and we invest in as well. But uh, that, that is not the only trend that is going to accelerate here. I think the, the other trend is people need to find uh, ways to have energy on energy conversion that is lower. Yes. And that, under that, there's a ton of things. There's just certainly high on the list, but then there are other things that go into that to have to enable a lower energy on energy conversion, which, you know, if you look at an area like the US uh, that has seen, you know, horizontal drilling, you know, zipper fracking and other things, uh, you know, they completely transformed energy on energy conversion. Yes. So we, we were excited about both. We we're also excited about the whole value chain, uh, not just upstream, but also midstream and downstream. There's opportunities everywhere in the in the value chain, uh, and also the you know ways to lower the carbon footprint. I think that's a 
that's a trend that can only strengthen for the for the reasons we discussed. So carbon capture, you know, uh, just you know, electrification sometimes at the wellhead, other things like that. These are very strong trends uh, that we're going to see accelerate going forward. Okay, um, Imran, uh, your views and perspective on this. Yeah, I mean, from, from a CSL venture perspective, we play broadly in energy across the board. Um, we are focused on heavily on the digital uh, space. So when I mean what I mean by digital is uh, software, big data analytics, AI, um, IoT companies. And, and when we're building a portfolio of 10 companies, I would say 70% of the portfolio would be in that space. But we are playing in the industrial and energy sector. So we are in the physical world. So we are looking at opportunities and investments in hardware, material science, chemistry. Um, um, and then we have specific what we call teams, if you want, that we call rising tides or things that are important to the sector uh, across the board. So electrical grids is one, one aspect which we are heavily focused on and saying, what can we do on the electrical grid side? Second thing is energy storage and any energy transition story, especially if you're going to look at renewables, whether it's wind or, or solar energy storage, the, the challenge of energy storage has to be solved. And, and just to put things in perspective, if you looked at the total US electricity generation today on any one given day, only 1% of that is stored today uh, as, as energy storage and 94% of that sits in hydroelectric where you basically move water above up and then it basically comes down and moves the turbine essentially so energy storage is is a big problem and then there's some other aspects one is obviously on the greenhouse gas emission side um, what can we do there's a whole aspect on gas flaring so today in the united states one billion cubic feet per day of gas is flared what can we do to can instead of flaring that gas which has obviously an, an environmental impact how, and it, it's wasted energy. How can you convert that into electrons in a cost-effective manner? Water is another very important aspect, both in the, in, in the industrial space, but also in the energy space. And what a lot of people don't realize, if the global oil production is 100 million barrels a day, for every barrel of oil that's produced, anywhere from th three to 10 barrels of associated water is produced. So how do you treat that water? What, how do you handle that water? How do you dispose of that water is a huge cost element, obviously, to the energy sector, but is also an environmental aspect. So those are what we call rising themes that we're addressing. And the last one, which is not really an energy one, but is also, which is cybersecurity, both in, in the industrial B2B world and in the, in the energy world is a very important topic that, that we're looking at. Great, so um, Imran, I just want to follow up. So what about technologies that are related to like hydrogen generation or the hydrogen value chain. Um, are you all looking into those kind of areas uh, specifically? So when we, we when we've defined our key teams, um, we have stayed away at this stage from two aspects, solar and wind. We're looking at those projects, but we haven't made any investments so far because we are still going up the learning curve on our domain knowledge because we want to be informed investors. And we just don't want to, if you want, spray and pray kind of approach. So we, we're, it's a little bit early days. On hydrogen economy and a lot of those, what we haven't made any investment so far. And one of the reasons we haven't made those so far is the time horizon. We are financial investors and we have a fund structure where we have to return our, uh, if you want, the money back to our investors within a certain time frame. So. If you want from the time we invest to the time we can monetize that investment is a critical aspect that we look at. And in the hydrogen economy right now, we haven't found the right opportunity to say, yes, if we make this investment, will we be able to monetize that investment in the given time frame? And then number two, the amount of quantum of capital that is needed for that company is probably above our check size, or if I take a boxing example, above our weight category at this stage. <laughs> to be in that match at this stage. So, okay. so we, have, we have to know what where we can add value the most. So if I were to ask you, what would one game changer technology that, you know, uh, blue sky type technologies that you're looking at, uh, is there anything or, or maybe a general theme uh, of, of blue sky technology? 
it, from my side, it will be in the digital space. We're looking at one company, in fact, a couple of companies right now that can ingest for both industrial and energy companies, time series, geospatial data, and other kinds of data and combine them um, and do it in a seamless, effortless manner. That's a in really interesting technology, we think. There's another company we're looking at, which is really looking at mo the mobile workforce uh, where you have if you want connected workers and how, how do you where you have a lot of telematics data coming up from um, from let's say um, worker um, utility workers going from point to point to point and how do you ingest that data and allow the company to be able to make efficiency decisions around that these are just two examples that would transform in the way data is consumed and analyzed in in the b2b world Thanks. What about SCF uh, Ventures, Hossam? I mean, where do you see as Blue Sky, Gree, you know, so-called game-changing type technology uh, emanate? So maybe I can answer that in the context of the other question you asked, Imran. So we, we look at uh, similar uh, areas and, you know, uh, CCUS and, uh, and other electrification and all of that. And we also, too, stayed out of uh, uh, wind, solar and hydrogen. Uh, not for anything, but, uh, uh, you know, we, we believe our uh, investment thesis is around scaling up things that have been standardized. And we feel that there's a lot of technology, uh, especially on the hydrogen side, hasn't been actually nailed down yet. And there's a lot of, uh, you know, new generation of technologies and uh, efficient way of doing hydrogen uh, uh, power transport and so on. So that's why we're staying away from it. And uh, on, on technologies, we actually like to be the, the rather than fix uh, one or two areas where we think there's going to be a blue sky and look for it, actually, uh, that doesn't become our thesis. Uh, we like to actually meet entrepreneurs who have insights on, on areas. And sometimes it's, it's boring or old or, you know, an area where it hasn't seen innovation for a while, but we got excited because we could see the potential of the change. Yes. So uh, we, we don't put a predetermined area or two or where there's a blue sky that we go after. We let the, the entrepreneurs with the best knowledge and the best uh, view on the market and the dislocation in the market to come to us. And then we use our experience to you know, diligence that and make sure that we're excited about it. Then we partner with them. Thank you, Hosam, for leading to the next uh, section of the, uh, the the topic. I mean, you, you nice segue to advice for entrepreneurs, correct? I mean, you know, we have a mix of listeners here. Some are very successful entrepreneurs trying to make their business resilient in this kind of uh, times. Uh, and others are still building their business and, you know, to a certain extent, experiencing a dramatic interruption for growth, correct? I mean, they've gone through that ideation part and now they are trying to to to, to scale up you know um, so what advice would you give some of them or maybe all of them um, so maybe break it up into let's say companies that you work in pre-seed ideation type technologies I mean, the seed stage where they are already have an MVP and the series A and beyond which is more of adoption and commercialization so if you can break it up into three three uh, big buckets, you know, what, what kind of advice would you give the entrepreneurs uh, uh, during this time? And I mean, short term and, 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 and more of a longer term. Uh, I, Imran, do you want to start? Or? Yeah, Hosam, okay. yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay, so, so I, I, I would start and say first, this is, you know, congratulations, this is the best job you're going to have uh, being an entrepreneur, having done this once before, started my own company, uh, I can attest this is the best job that out there. So congratulations on that. And I would say the first thing that comes to mind is uh, uh, value proposition. And, uh, you know, as soon as you have an idea, and hopefully this comes from a, a, a good, strong base of understanding of that market, understanding of that product, or, you know, what are you trying to change and why? And I would say the first thing you need to do at the early stage is understand your value proposition and then gets as much feedback as you can uh, on that value proposition from customers, from uh, different people in the market. You don't have to follow every advice you get because uh, they tend to be contradicting, but fine tuning your value proposition as is a paramount 
uh, you know, uh, for, 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 for any entrepreneur. The second is the product market fit. And the quicker you uh, find where in the market your value proposition will work and what's the constraint, the price point, the cost, the, you know, can you scale it up or not? That's the next thing to do. And uh, if you have those two right, I think the rest sorts itself out. Um, and, and I would say the earlier you do it with the less capital you raise until you do that, the more you keep out of, uh, of their company, yes. And obviously the more appealing as an investment it becomes later for investors. So uh, those two are, I would say, the two paramount things you have to fix. And once you're past, uh, past that in series A and series B, is all about how do you grow, uh, uh, you know, uh, profitably, not you know, using a lot of capital and staying on plan. And and sometimes I, I give this advice to some entrepreneurs: you can scale your skills to go to the next level, and uh, but then sometimes you don't like to, uh, you know, uh, do the the what it takes to be successful in Series A, B, and C. So maybe you need to complement your teams with, you know, people who know how to scale up the company and be good managers and you know detailed oriented and all of that so uh be be honest with yourself and what what you're good at and what you'd like to and find uh, people in your team that can complement the team uh, so those would be my advice for entrepreneurs going through that journey well 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 he did advice uh, imran your views please i i think um i think the best thing the way i would describe it is how do we evaluate entrepreneurs or companies? And uh, we have a eight-dimensional cube <laughs> that we would look at in terms of eight axes. But the num single most important factor that we decide is really the team. End of the day, when you have a young company, whether it's seed or series A or series B, and, and, and CSL Ventures typically playing in the in the seed to series B stage. So our, our sweet spot is seed and series A if I, if I was to look at those. And in that stage, you're looking at a very young company. And, and generally speaking, we're investing in a company with a minimum viable product, with some revenue, some cut, uh, commercial traction, anywhere from a few hundred thousand dollars to a couple of million dollars. Um, now in that sector, when you're investing in someone, you're really investing in the team. So my first and foremost advice to the entrepreneur is build the right team. Now the team might be one founder or two co-founders, but in any team, as you start scaling up from seed, from an MVP to series A to series B to series C, your team has to evolve as the company evolves. And you can have a founder who might be wonderful, um, as Hossam was giving an example of, where you can be a great uh, CEO or CTO for a seed or series A. But once you go to the growth phase, maybe you need to bring someone else and you take the CTO role or you take another role. and give up the CEO role to someone else. So being able to build and morph that team, I think is very, very important. The second thing is don't try and be everything to everyone. Be focused. Because when you're, when you're a young company, you have limited resources, you have limited capital, be hyper-focused on the problem you're trying to solve. But at the same time, if the market is telling you that the problem you're trying to solve isn't the right one, be ready to pivot and have the resilience and the ability to, to, to once the market pushes you down to the ground to, to, to step up and, and, and get back up. I think those are very important aspects that we look at when we're looking at entrepreneurs. The other aspect which I think is very important is, is the investor. What are, what are you looking for in an investor? Obviously you're looking for capital and everyone would bring capital. But I see too often entrepreneurs getting too hyper-focused on valuation. I'm not saying valuation is not important, valuation is important. But there's many other factors that an entrepreneur or founders have to think about and say, okay, what am I, what am I looking for in that investor? If it's only capital, then yeah, you can be hyper-focused on your, on your valuation. But if you're looking for guidance, if you're looking for strategic advice, if you're looking for technology development advice, if you're looking for Rolodex and customer introductions, then those are important factors that, that, that the entrepreneur or the company should be looking at and not just the valuation because I've seen that too often. And my last piece, especially in the current environment of the pandemic and what 
all of us have gone through over the last one year and will probably go through for at least the near term. I think being high, every entrepreneur needs to be hyper-focused on the customer and be ready to pivot. So really top line growth is what I'm trying to say and be ready to pivot in case the market has changed. And there's so many industries that have obviously been completely disrupted in the last one year. And those that have moved on or pivoted have been successful. Even restaurants, the restaurant sector has been the one that's probably been the most disrupted in the pandemic. But there are some situations where entrepreneurs or some restauranters or owners have, have pivoted into the right model and their businesses are, are still thriving and have actually grown year over year in the current macro. So I, I like the point where you talked about the team and the genetic makeup of typical oil and gas startups. Do you see a different type of genome for, how shall I say, leaders in the energy transition type technology? Is it the same, are they cut from the same cloth? And do you see that you need to assess companies differently, um, those who are going into the new energies as opposed to the typical oil and gas? Uh, maybe Imran, you want to take this on first and then we we'll get how some. Uh, so I'm just reflecting on, I think what has happened, if you're an entrepreneur who's gone out and I'm talking here specifically oil and gas in the last five years, unfortunately, you've been beaten down a little bit <laughs> <laughs> because if you were, if you made your startup in 15 or 16 and you're now in 2020, it, it's been a painful macro. And we just have to, I mean, I'll give you an example. Out of our six investments we've made, five are thriving doing growing year over year between 20 and 300%. One, we had to shut down. And that company was started in call it 2017, 2018 timeframe. And they were focused with a software solution in unconventional reservoirs and U, US focused. And they came out with a product last year, got some market traction, and then they just got the double swan of effect double swan event of COVID-19 and the excess production from OPEC in March killed them. So we had to shut that business down. So that's one thing I'll say is, it, at least at a high level perspective, when I look at entrepreneurs, perhaps in the renewables or perhaps in coming out, because we also look at other technologies and other verticals that we can bring to energy and industrial and vice versa. So one of the companies I'm referring to is actually not just an energy, this it has a multi-industry application. And the entrepreneurs are, are a little bit different in terms of mood and morale, generally speaking. And I'm making a gross generalization here. So please take it with a rock of salt, not with a pinch of salt. Um, but that's 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 an observation I would make is, is oil and gas um, entrepreneurs have, have unfortunately been hammered a little bit in the last four or five years. So Sam, I don't know what, what, what you've seen overall. I, I, I agree. I think it has been a tough market and, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, been very difficult for starting a new company, but, you know, the people who have a, a good positioning on uh, value creation and they persevere, we see them doing well and thriving like what you said, Imran. Uh, to get back to the question, uh, Thomas, you asked about, is there a difference between the characteristics of an entrepreneur for a new energy versus, let's say, oil and gas. I don't think so. I think it's uh, both have to have passion for what they're doing. Both have to have deep understanding of the application and the problem they're, you know, trying to solve. Uh, you know, they really believe in, in what they're doing and they take no, uh, they don't take no for an answer and driven and motivated. Uh, I've always said that, you know, you, you just in this industrial uh, you know, uh, business to business uh, 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 startups, you have to have deep understanding of the application, how your customers are using your product, how, what's the value chain, what's the knockoff effect if you make a change and all of that. So I, I don't see any change in this. The only other change, the only change I can think of is, you know, uh, new energy now, because, you know, it's a growing industry, it tend to be a momentum investing. So you're, uh, you know, investing and, you know, making your money on the next investor more than uh, making your money because you're making profits, yes? So it takes a little bit difference in, in approach when positioning the company overall when you're doing an exit or something like that, yes? 
But other than this, the fundamentals of doing business and uh, creating value and capturing value are the same anywhere uh, with an industrial buyer, yes. Okay, no, thanks. That's really uh, enlightening in terms of trying to understand that, that so-called difference, correct? I mean, you said there's no difference and I, I tend to agree with you. Um, there has always been uh, um, in the oil and gas uh, an appetite for risk of, uh, uh, evasion, correct? I mean, because we are in a higher risk environment uh, as opposed to the renewables and new energies. But yeah. again, um, Coming back to, to you guys raising capital, I mean, are you all raising capital for your funds uh, currently? And if so, what kind of uh, typical investor profile are you looking for? Uh, Hossam, you want to lead this? So we, we raised our ninth fund in uh, early 2018. And, uh, you know, we had the, 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 or actually SCF has a huge track record and I've been very fortunate to join them. And, uh, you know, they had uh, the same investors for all the nine funds and, you know, normally so far uh, up to that point, the uh, the capital raise is very short, and uh, you know, uh, normally it's the same investors re upping again. So actually, we haven't gotten new investors, uh, or I say materially new investors in the last period. So we're not raising right now. We're in uh, you know maybe forty percent of the cap that capital deployed, but we could be in a few years from now. Uh, and, uh, you know, normally our investors are institutional investors uh, and we have a couple of uh, high net worthy in individuals that are invested in our fund. Um, so so just to, yeah, so this to, to, to kind of include that energy transition, do you see then that investment that you have raised in 2018 be diverted for some uh, new energies type uh, play? Uh, and, I, and I'm sure we would be curious to understand if Imran has the same position. We, when we invest, we have a very specific mandate and we stay within the mandate. So our mandate is in, within the energy, So there, but there's a scope uh, within energy services and there's a scope. So when you raise a fund, there's a documents that governs what, what you could invest in or not. To, to make a change, you have to go back and get consent from your investors. Um, okay. So that's normally the fund structure, yes. Okay, great. And Imran, um, what about you guys? Are you raising capital for your funds? And if so, what's the typical investor profile you're looking at? So we are raising funds um, because our venture technology effort is relatively new. So our fund three has seeded the, the effort, which is why we, we went public in August of, of last year. So the investors there agreed to, to seed it. And, and the typical fund three investors are similar to the kind of key folks that Hassam is referring to, which is financial institutions, endowments, family offices, um, uh, foundations, folks like that. Um, but on, on our co-invest vehicle for specifically venture technology, we're trying to attract those investors who don't want, because traditionally, if you want CSL as being a private equity firm, we are trying to, let's say, diversify our investor base on those with this co-invest vehicle to those investors who want pure venture technology exposure because it's a different profile, it's a different risk. Um, in private equity, you make six to eight investments. Generally speaking, four or five of them will, will, will be okay. In venture technology, you may gonna build, we're trying to build a portfolio of 10 investments. We're trying to hit one or two home runs. And if you get those one or two home runs, that home run will give the total capital back from the fund plus the return. So that's what we're trying to do. So it's a different profile. So we have made six investments. As I mentioned, one we shut down uh, because of, in, in 2020 because of the current macro. Five are thriving, growing between 20 and, and 300% a year, year over year in terms, in terms of top line growth. So 2020 versus 2019. And, uh, and the portfolio touch word has been marked up by 50% in the last one year. So investors will have an opportunity of still coming in at par value uh, if they were to give us capital. Um, so, and, and have an unrealized gain of, of about 50% because the way we have had funding rounds for subsequent funding rounds for the companies, they've touch wood all, all been have had healthy step ups um, anywhere from 40% on a post money to pre money basis, as much as up to 300%. Um, over the last one year. Um, so, so we are raising money and the typical investor would be again, we're looking for three different sets, financial institutions, 
high net worth individuals and family offices, but we're also looking for corporates uh, or select corporates in the energy industrial space because those corporates can also, uh, we, can be, we can be their technology arm or be part of the technology solution. At the same time, um, we can also uh, have them as potential customers or strategic investors in some of these companies as well. So if someone were to invest in one of your funds, Imran, I mean, how can they proceed? I mean, uh, what, what are some of the steps, uh, for example? Is it as simple as picking up the phone and calling you? What step is called 1-800-IMRAN? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, just drop me an email, imran at cslenergy.com, or reach out to, to any of us in CSL, and, and we'll, we'll sit down go through the investor deck with you, share with you details on our companies. Uh, and, and the other advantage is if you're an investor coming in, you have visibility or 60% visibility into the portfolio because you're building a portfolio of 10 investments, six have been done. Um, so there's another four in the pipe that we intend to make between now and let's say in the next 12 to 15 months. Great, excellent. I think we have come uh, to, to kind of a close to uh, an end. I'm looking at some of the uh, uh, questions. Um, there is one uh, question that, that that came up on the consolidation of digital startups, correct? We see a lot of so-called, I mean, before the COVID happened, there were a lot of companies in the digital space that provided very similar AI machine learning type so-called capabilities. Do you see going forward I mean, the need for consolidation on these digital startups to improve adoption. Because, I mean, if you take a look at companies who are adopting this technology, you know, this, they, they, they throw up their arms and say, hey, you know, there is, I, I cannot choose from A and B or C and D, correct? If I wish I had both A's so-called capabilities and B's competencies and, 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 and then I'll have one product rather than trying to get. Do you see there is going to be a, how shall I say, Con, a need for consolidation of digital startups, or some. I mean, uh, let's let's uh, get that. I, I I would agree with hundred percent with that. I think the the this area, while it's very promising and it's going to create a lot of value for end users, you know, there's a, a very low barriers to entry. Uh, there's uh, no IP uh, to speak of in in the software space, which means if people see a, a feature or see a group of features, they're able to replicate. So the competition is very strong in that area. And uh, uh, the flip side of that uh, software business is once you have adoption with customers tend to be very sticky, yes? So I think what will happen is, uh, you know, there's many people are trying to, uh, you know, uh, start and all of them have the same, you know, like what you said, you sit in their presentations, at least the first presentations, you can tell them apart. Uh, you know, you and I go to uh, some of those, uh, pitches and, uh, you know, startups and, you know, you could sit and have 10 of them and you could say they're all the same or very much the same. Uh, so that has to shake out. Yes. And uh, the way it's going to shake out is probably some of them will have tractions with customers. And then like what we've seen in the, uh, you know, geos geoscience software in the past, you know, it ended up uh, two very large players uh, who ended up controlling 70, 80% of the market. I, I don't see this as any different. Maybe it wouldn't be as consolidated as uh, the geoscience software, but it's going to end up being consolidated. Imran, any last words on that yeah, consolidation? I think, of... I, I think one is an observation. These days, any entrepreneur who comes in starts with machine learning, AI, and data <laughs> analytics just on the get-go, even if it's a hardware business. So, so I think entrepreneurs need to say, look, this is the true value proposition and not use them as buzzwords. Secondly, I would agree that there's some degree of consolidation that's gonna inevitably take place. But I think there'll be select winners and quite a few losers. So there's some companies that are not gonna be around um, because they're not gonna survive uh, because either someone else has developed a better product. So I, I think there's gonna be some degree of if you want combinations or M&A activity or acquisitions and, and combinations. But I think if there's 20 companies in the digital space five years from now or 10 years from now, in that whatever those 20 companies are, there'll be maybe three or four left, left standing. 
Hey, gentlemen, we are, uh, it's excellent to speak to both of you. It's the, the hour has just flown by so fast. Uh, exciting conversation. Thank you so much uh, to Imran and Hossam for your insightful thoughts. And I trust the audience found some nuggets of advice and forethoughts for this journey we are on. It's cautious, but it's cautious optimism, correct? Um, and we would like to wish the audience a safe and prosperous new year and to be resilient with the challenges ahead in 2021. So good day and good night. Thank you, Hibran and Hossam. And thank you, Ty. Thomas, thank you for thank hosting you. us and thank you to Ty. Yeah, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, Ty. And uh, pleasure to be with you, Amr. All the best. Thank you.